Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we'll start with the CME sessions for today. Uh, the CME sessions will be chaired by Dr. Susina, who is also um, the director of, uh, sorry, <laughs> additional vice principal of uh, research. <laughs> Highest respect for her because yesterday I was at a DSMB and uh, had to interact with her at a completely different level <laughs> as the co-primary in investigator. Dr. Divya, I'll introduce her to you as our alumni entertainment secretary because that's what my level of interaction with her is uh, with her is and she will be co-chairing the cme which is quite appropriate i think for her position uh, dr alfred has politely declined the request uh, to join the table i'm not sure for what reasons uh, so we'll go ahead I'll, uh, dr susina is uh, also batch of 95 batch of 95 and she is a professor in nephrology uh, she presently holds additional vice principal of research and has also been uh, prince, uh, in charge of the quality, quality management cell for quite some time before this. And a lot of the NABH accreditation programs and things were done when she was, uh, uh, she was there. She has done her MBBS, MD and DM nephrology from here. And like I mentioned during the last CME, she's also completed a PhD which started off before COVID and she finished her PhD defense and uh, uh, in 2020, I believe it was, and that was this year, okay. And it was done through a COVID period, and I, something was uh, online, wasn't it? Your examination or something? The Viva was uh, online, so one of the things that, uh, you know, it was going to be very unique to a lot of uh, uh, educational achievements this over this uh, period of last two years, including some of the MBBS exams, MD exams, and even PhDs, is the amount of things that have actually gone online. So over to you, uh, Susina and Dr. Divya. Good evening, friends. Uh, it's my honor to introduce the speakers for today's CME session. Uh, the first speaker for today is uh, Dr. Monisha Esther Nongpio. She's from the youngest batch for this year's mini reunion, which is a batch of 1996. Uh, she walked into women's hostel in her traditional Northeastern attire. And she was in a complete culture shock as she had to transition into Salva Kameez. But her adaptability was remarkable and her fun-loving nature uh, was uh, uh, the one thing that all her classmates uh, remember about her. So after graduation, she did her MD ophthalmology from Ames, New Delhi. Then she went on to do PhD in ophthalmology from the National University of Singapore. Uh, presently, she's a clinician scientist at the Singapore Eye Research Institute and Singapore National Eye Center. Uh, she balances both clinical and research related work in glaucoma and her main clinical research interest is primary angle closure glaucoma. She currently holds academic appointment at Duke and U.S. Medical School, Singapore, as Associate Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Science Academic Clinical Program. Uh, she is a member of various advisory boards, has more than 110 publications, holds two patents. Her H index is 32, is a DSMB committee member and editorial board member for many journals. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Monisha Esther Longpio. Thank you, Sheena, for the introduction. Um, I'd first like to thank the, uh, the Alumni Association for the CME, and of course, for my batchmates for getting me to do this. Uh, didn't really have a choice. Um, so my talk today is on um, how imaging has helped us to understand angle closure glaucoma better. So this is just an introduction of where I work. So the Singapore Eye Research Institute is the research arm of the Singapore National Eye Center. And we are located at the, we have uh, shared about two and a half levels at the academia building of the Singhealth Duke NUS Academic Medical Center. So that's where we have our laboratories as well as research and academic offices. Whereas research patients uh, for the various studies are seen at the research clinics at the National Eye Center. So coming straight to the talk, um, I'm sure many of you would have had your off health posting many, many years ago. So just a brief introduction on glaucoma. So it is an optic neuropathy with characteristic optic nerve head changes and corresponding visual field loss. It is a leading cause of irreversible blindness worldwide. And it is categorized by the configuration of the angles into two types, open angle glaucoma 
and ankle closure glaucoma. So the ankle is actually an important part for um, in, in glaucoma because it is responsible for drainage of the aqueous humor and impairment of uh, drainage of the aqueous results in elevated eye pressure, which then causes damage to the retinal nerve fiber, uh, retinal ganglion cells resulting in optic nerve damage. So um, the mechanism for elevated eye pressure in open angle and angle closure are slightly different. So in angle closure, in open angles, the angles are open. So impairment of the aqueous occurs due to um, resistance to the flow of the aqueous at the angles. Whereas in angle closure, it's mainly a mechanical or um, an anatomical obstruction of the angles. And uh, how do we differentiate them? By uh, what we do is a gonioscopy where we can directly visualize the angles using a gonio lens, which is placed in the eye. And uh, you can see that uh, this is the image that you get uh, on gonioscopy. As you can see in open angle glaucoma, I don't know if it's clear, but um, you can see a lot of features that are seen in the angles, uh, this area. Whereas an angle closure, because the uh, structures are not visible, that's why it looks very featureless. Uh, so primary angle glaucoma is disproportionately more common amongst Asians, and it is also more uh, visually uh, damaging than uh, its counterpart, the open angle glaucoma, which is more common amongst Caucasians. So who gets angle closure? Uh, so as you can see in the figure, the eyes with angle closure are characterized by having crowded anterior chambers. So the known biometric risk factors for angle closure include a shallower anterior chamber depth, short axial length, and an increase in lens thickness. And the demographic uh, risk factors include female gender, older age group, and East Asian et ethnicity. However, in the last few years, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that uh, angle closure is not fully explained by variations of these factors, which suggests that there could be other factors that may be responsible for the disease. So with the advent and advances of imaging technology, including anterior segment imaging, such as the anterior segment optical coherence tomography of the ASOCT, we're now able to not only visualize, but to also quantitatively measure the different anterior segment structures. So this slide just shows the uh, evolution of the ASOCT machine over the years, and they've been around only for the last 15 to 17 years. And of course, now we have their second or third generation, which gives higher quality and better high resolution images. So when the ASOCD machine first came, the earlier papers looked at uh, the analyzed, uh, the qualitatively, whether the angles were open or closed. And the inbuilt um, analysis software within the machine as well were focused only on the angles. Um, however, as the more ASOC machines came into uh, the market, a lot of research centers then developed their own customized image analysis software. Uh, one of them uh, is the ZAP or the Zongshan Angle Assessment Program, which is semi-automated image analysis software, which was developed in 2008. And very fortuitously, this was the time when I started working on anterior segment imaging as well. So as you can see, in addition to the angles, it also provided um, uh, quantitative measurements of the other uh, uh, parameters in the uh, in the eye, such as the anterior chamber, lens, and iris. And um, what the ASOCT image also gives us is the visualization, the cross-sectional image, which was previously not possible with uh, on-slit lamp examination or gonioscopy. So it gives us a different picture to what we can see clinically. So uh, using the ZAP software, uh, what we first did was we identified a lot of novel um, imaging-based risk factors. I'll just go through them uh, quickly. So the first parameters that we looked at were uh, iris uh, parameters. So we found that um, eyes with angle closure were, were associated with significantly thicker iris, um, iris with greater iris curvature as well as uh, greater iris area. We also found that the width uh, of the angle, which is the angular angle distance called the anterior chamber width was also an independent risk factor for angle closure. And uh, smaller anterior chamber area and volume were also significantly associated with an increased risk for angle closure. Now, coming to the lens, we defined a parameter known as the lens vault, which is actually a quantitative measurement of the amount of lens that is located directly anterior, I'm sorry, this image didn't come out, okay. Um, uh, directly related anterior, I, would, I mean, it's, it's a quantification of the amount of lens that is related, um, uh, that is 
present directly in front of the lens. So it's uh, in front of the angle. So it's a measurement that is uh, unlike the lens thickness, the lens vault uh, is a measurement that is directly related to the angles. So when we looked at the association with different lens parameters, we found that the lens fault was more strongly associated with angle closure performed better than the other traditional uh, lens parameters such as lens thickness, lens position. So it's, it is perhaps a better marker for assessing the role of the lens in angle closure. So these studies suggest that angle closure is not a homogenous disease and that anatomical risk factors may be different in different individuals. And there could be subtypes of angle closure which are based on these uh, anatomical features. So in order to answer some of these questions, what we first did was we wanted to see which are the most important anatomical parameters. So we evaluated the determinants of the angle width because the angle width is a key anatomical feature which is important for ca categorization of open angles and angle closure. So for this, we incorporated the known or the established um, risk factors as well as the newly identified uh, parameters, ASOC based features. And we found that the single best predictors of angle width, which explained about 50% of the variation were the anterior chamber volume area and the lens vault. And a combination of six parameters explained about 80% of variation in angle width. So we then evaluated, we wanted to see how well that these parameters uh, uh, perform in uh, detecting angle closure. So we evaluated the diagnostic um, accuracy of six different prediction algorithms. And we had evaluated both a full variable set, which included not only the ASOST parameters, uh, but also the traditional risk factors and uh, uh, demographic risk factors, as well as a reduced variable set, which consisted of only the six parameters that were previously identified uh, as predictors of angle width. So what we found was all six prediction algorithms performed uh, similarly. They were equally good with a high AUC, but the stepwise logistic regression performed normally better in both the full as well as a reduced variable set uh, with high AUCs of more than 0 0.9495. And we then also compared, we wanted to see whether the AUCs were different between the full variable sets and the reduced variable set. And we found that they perform equally well. There was very little difference when we used all the parameters or when we included only the six different parameters. So um, therefore a model which consists of just six ASOC parameters, which can be easily obtained from a single ASOC scan, could uh, predict um, gonioscope angle closure with a high accuracy of um, an AUC of 0 0.95. So now that we know some parameters are important, we wanted to see, okay, are, there anatom are the anatomical risk factors now different in different individuals? So this study was based on the previous paper on, uh, on the findings of the stepwise logistic regression, where we then um, developed what we call an angle closure score. So that the, the output of the score was not very intuitive. So we converted the score into a probability estimate uh, with a value, with an output value uh, that varies between zero and one. So a value of one uh, was, gives a higher probability of having angle closure and values closer to zero were less probability. And we also uh, generated from the score, we also generated a graphical representation of the relative contributions of the different parameters. So this is just an illustration of the graphical representation with the corresponding SOST images. So red, so the gold standard here for presence of angle closure or not was gonioscopy. So the ones in red shows the uh, was diagnosed to have angle closure and you look at the probability were also closer to one. So as you can see in the first figure, the contribution to the angle closure was uh, anterior chamber area volume and lens fault. Whereas in the second figure, there was less contribution of the anterior chamber area and more of the iris thickness, uh, IT750. So the, the, the height of the bars does not, um, uh, it, it's not the measurement of the parameters, but rather the contribution to the, to the closure. Uh, when you look at the third, uh, the last figure, the one in green, it did not have angle closure and the score also showed a probability of zero and all the parameters were negative for, for angle closure. So um, now that we know some patients do have, um, uh, some parameters may be important in some patients, we then wanted to see if we could subgroup angle closure. So this, as this could have perhaps have an impact on management because the traditional 
conventional management of angle closure, the initial management of angle closure is a performance of a laser iridotomy where we, uh, you know, we, we perform, um, apply a laser spot to, to create a hole in the, in the iris. So what that does is, oh, oh no, some images have not come up. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. So, so what it shows is that uh, after a laser, some the angle which is closed it opens up due to the uh, because of the relief of the convexity of the iris due to pupil block. But some angles, so it's actually an image to show before and after a laser. But some angles do not open up after a laser, which uh, then suggests the role of other non-pupil block mechanisms. So for the subgrouping methods, what we did was we had no predetermined assumptions of what were the important parameters or the optimum number of subgroups. We defined, um, we obtained them statistically using hierarchical clustering and Gaussian mixture model. So what we found was that in PSEG, we could uh, um, categorize them into three distinct uh, subgroups each subgroup with a distinct, uh, with a predominant phenotype. So in subgroup one, we found that um, it was characterized by uh, these eyes that were uh, categorized to um, subgroup one, we found to have a larger iris area with a relatively smaller lens vault and a deep ACD, uh, anterior chamber depth. Whereas subgroup two, uh, the eyes categorized subgroup two uh, had features that had large lens vault with uh, relatively shallow anterior chamber depth and subgroup three had features that were in between subgroup one and two. So this is just again, an illustration of um, images from each of the three subgroups. So uh, subgroup one being the predominantly iris component, this uh, suggests that the presence of an iris with a large cross-sectional area may result in angle crowding in these eyes and uh, this causing subsequent angle closure and also, there's a, uh, a type of uh, mechanism known as plateau iris, which is characterized by deep anterior chambers. So in these patients, it is likely that a procedure known as laser iridoplasty, I hope the images come out, may be beneficial. Yes. So what we do with in iridoplasty is we apply laser shots around the periphery of the iris, and that causes um, shrinkage or, or contra um, contraction of the peripheral iris, res which results in opening of the angles. And this is a slit lamp image to show the laser spots. I don't know if you can see them clearly. And subgroup two, which is a lens component. So in these patients, perhaps lens extraction may be more effective at, in opening up the angles. And subgroup three is a mixture of components. It's again suggests that there could be other mechanisms that may be involved in some of these patients. So in summary, with the anterior segment imaging, it's helped us to object to um, objectively assess the angles and also to quantitatively measure anterior segment structures. And this has led to new insights into angle closure mechanisms. So coming back to the title of my talk on deconstructing angle closures, I've only talked about just one aspect that I'm working on, which is um, imaging and that too. It's just to tell how the identification of risk factors actually led us to the next question and the next, and you know, eventually coming out with a subgrouping uh, of, of the disease. So we're also, uh, so in, in SERI, we are um, doing a lot of research in angle closure blockomers. So we're also involved in uh, elucidating the dynamic features of eyes with angle closure. And also we have a good biomechanics team, which looks at not only, uh, they have computational methods of not only looking at the biomechanics of the um, optic nerve head, but also of the anterior segment structures. And uh, we are, I'm also involved in uh, unraveling the genetic um, uh, architecture of angle closure. And I think that was too much for this talk to talk about genetics. So we are working, we've identified several novel genes for angle closure. And we're also working with um, looking at genotype phenotype correlation for the disease. So in summary, given the substantial clinical heterogeneity of angle closure, it is likely that susceptibility to disease is probably mediated by distinct mechanisms that may be different to different individuals. However, this is just the first step. Longitudinal studies are still warranted to better elucidate what is the optimum uh, management strategies for these patients. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in angle closure. And in the last 10 to 15 years, we've just kind of unraveled a lot of the uh, different phenotypes that are there in the disease. However, like I said, there's still a lot of um, longitudinal studies still needed 
to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions. And it is also important to identify those at the greatest risk of disease, progression and blindness. And there's also perhaps a role of artificial intelligence for disease stratification and angle closure. And uh, we're working on a multimodal model, uh, uh, models of combining imaging genetics in order to better assess the risk of patients who are likely to develop, um, to, to identify early those who are likely to develop uh, primary ankle closure glaucoma. So research is a team effort and none of this work would have been possible without the, combined, uh, the contribution of the trial coordinators, nurses, technicians, um, uh, co collaborators, as well as clinicians. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Manisha, for that very extensive presentation. Uh, we do have time to take two questions from the audience. Uh, one question from me. Uh, we do know that AI has had a huge impact in the field of ophthalmology. Uh, do you think AI will replace ophthalmologists or at least the uh, technical level staff? Um, so I actually have the slides. I was expecting the question. <laughs> so, so usually when I um, usually present imaging talks, one of the questions that we are asked is, will ASOC replace gonioscopy? So like I said in the beginning, um, yes, both uh, gonioscopy and um, uh, ASOCT allow visualization of the angles. However, there are different, both, the different things, that you, different information that you can garner from both uh, gonioscopy as well as ASOCT, and they do not really, comp they do not, they do not interchangeable. So, the answer is perhaps no. I mean, we still need to be very good with our clinical acumens. Gonioscopy is not easy, takes time to practice. So uh, no, perhaps no, um, not really, not, not fully, because the information garnered from each examination is unique and they complement each other. And I think if available, they should be used concurrently for a more complete assessment. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? We'll pass on the mic to you. We'll pass on the mic to you. Uh, just since uh, lens vault has come out as such a significant factor, you think uh, then that would be and something, would you uh, kind of encourage clear lens extraction because of that? Uh, or how, what's your take on that? Not really. I think um, based on the... I, uh, the studies that, that have been, I don't know, since this is not an ophthalmology audience, perhaps you are, but the Eagle study as well as the, the, the recent uh, ZAP trial and the analyst trial. So what it says is clear lens extraction, perhaps in asymptomatic patients, perhaps not, because uh, in the early stages of glaucoma, no, but in the later stages, uh, perhaps yes, if the eye pressure is not high, but not in uh, primary angle closure suspects or maybe PAC. Thank you. Yeah. No more questions. And thank you, Manisha. Thank you. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Alfred to present her, uh, Dr. Manisha with a certificate of appreciation. Our next speaker is Dr. Samson Sujit Kumar Gadav. He's from the batch of 1990. The famous monikers for this batch is beauty with brains and pathological pally. So Dr. Samson Sujit Kumar entered the men's hostel as a, from a Tamil medium school as a non-English speaking men's hostelite but he exited men's hostel as the best outgoing student of the batch of 1990. After completing MBBS, he did MCH uh, in CMC, and uh, he went on to work in uh, various uh, countries. He worked with, in Baylor College, USA. He worked in Macquarie University, Australia, Square Hospitals, Bangladesh, and Sun Sunshine Hospital, Secunderabad. Currently, he is a consultant at ESI Medical College, Sanat Nagar, and he is also the director of Unicorpus Health Foundation, which is a non-for-profit organization and 
uh, Youth for the Truth Ministries. He was the first Asian to obtain the degree of Masters in Advanced Surgery in Spine from Macquarie University. He's won many national and international awards. He's also completed his Bachelor of Christian Studies from Serampur and also completed 10 months of internship in youth ministry at Lakewood Church, Houston, Texas, and won the Director's Award. He's known even now as a king of the batch of 1990 because he is famous for tutoring all his batchmates during their final year exams. Uh, and it was his dream that the batch, uh, pa uh, the, all the members of the batch pass uh, in their first attempt. So ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you, Dr. Samson Surjit Kumar. All glory to God and praise the Lord and thank you for the kind intro. Greetings to all of you and uh, greetings to all the alumni, all the students and uh, all my teachers here uh, on behalf of the sweet and intelligent, muddy, naughty and uh, the mighty batch of 1990. Hey, praise God. So I'm here to give a simple presentation about affordable specialty and super specialty surgical care in urban setup an evolving model. For this presentation, the word affordable will include quality and ethical services. Affordable healthcare is relative but very relevant in India with 140 crore population, uh, predominantly comprising of middle class with non-uniform healthcare services and the middle class bearing the brunt of the cost of healthcare. There is a need for affordable care there's a recent study done from Chhattisgarh, which is a, one of the poorest states in India, where it has shown that in the OP, one OP visit would cost the government in public sector 400 rupees versus non-formal private sector costing 586 rupees and a private sector, formal private sector costing 2,643. This escalates into the IP sector also. We have uh, hospitals for 3,000 plus private, 25,000 plus public. Number of specialty hospitals, there's no clear number. And the load of specialty cases is on the rise. So we have hospitals which are available, but the question is how many of them are affordable? So who decides the bill of a patient? Hospitals, mainly the private hospitals. We know that there are no regulations for these bills. The surgeon fee decides the patient bill, anesthesia fee decides the patient bill, the medicals, consumables, implants decide the patient. The last but the important thing is the percentage. 30% of the bill goes to the person, the people who bring patients to the hospitals. So this brings us to an important factor called medical mafia, which is increasing, becoming more powerful every day and extends from the grassroots levels in villages to the higher officials in the system. It includes RMPs, medical workers, some brokers, paramedics like ambulance drivers, the paramedics who bring patients from the road after the road traffic accidents, insurance guys, and sadly, but truly the fact is that many pastors are also getting attracted to these packages because the packages are 30% of the medical bill plus monthly refreshments in the nearby resorts, and now it's increased to holiday packages in India and abroad. So they make more money than many of us sitting here. So that's the effect of medical mafia in India. So this is just for an example, the spine, brain and spine surgeries. City one in India, the cost of brain tumor surgery is three lakhs, spine surgery is 2.5 lakhs plus implants. City two in India, the same thing costs four lakhs and three lakhs, 3.5 lakhs. So what can we do? So when we were discussing about the many of our members from CMC alumni were discussing about these things, we started praying about it. And we know that we have nothing but this an empty, empty slide like this. We have the living God with us. We look up to him. And in faith, we take the journey forward. 
So we came together and formed this Unicopper Cell Foundation, which is a model that is being shaped. And uh, this is our logo. The motto is to each one for the benefit of all. And the tagline of no one own your health. So that's a, that's a people in the picture. Most of them are familiar to people here. There are students from batches of 83, 89, 90, 93, and uh, other batches. And some of them are uh, healthcare professionals, but who are not connected to CMC. So the vision is to come together as members, as a team, to address these problems. So the vision is from the first book of Corinthians chapter 12, and the verse 7 gives us a motto to each one for the benefit of all. So Unicopper Cell Foundation was registered as a not-for-profit Section 8 company in 2015. And it is registered as a secular company. It is 12A ATG approved, and it is governed by the board of directors. So the mission is to, there's a mission to the patients, to the employees, to the society, and to the training aspect. This has been our growth so far by the grace of God. So we started with a small senior citizen polyclinic and then the polyclinic grew. And then we started a small 25 bedded hospital. And 2020, 2021, we could play our role as a small but significant role in treating patients with COVID, both online and offline, uh, in a, in a, at an affordable cost. So this is a polyclinic that is located in Sikandabad uh, in uh, this in a YMCA center. So this polyclinic has 40 plus consultants from all specialty and special super specialties. So here affordable outpatient care is provided and there's a good team of uh, medical and dental specialists available here. Coming to specialty and super specialty, we also have very unique comprehensive spine clinic where a patient is seen by orthopedic surgeon, spine surgeon, and the physiotherapist at the same sitting. And this is Sweet Buddy program started by one of our alumnus, Dr. Rahul. You can see him here. So as you see, this Unicopper Cell Foundation is possible because of the fact that we who are in this group are connected in some way or the other to CMC. And I'm proud of that because that is the backbone of Unicopper's being an uh, being alumni of uh, CMC Velo. This is a 25 bedded hospital that was started in 2020. And this is where we are offering affordable care. This is uh, general surgeries. And you can see Dr. Josna there from batch of 2003. She's the medical superintendent there who stays in the campus and takes care of the hospital. These are all the surgeries. There are a lot of OG surgeries. You can see Dr. Jalja Veronica from batch of 83 and uh, OG surgeries laparoscopy surgeries, orthotrauma and orthoscopy surgeries, urology, we have Paul Navin from batch of 96 who helps us. And then pediatric surgery. Just want to pause here for a moment because pediatric surgery was a challenge for us. So when we started getting patients, then we started connecting to some local doctors there. And then just want to share about this case. This was a bladder extrophy case. This case was actually referred from Hyderabad to Coimbatore for further management. But then this patient came to us and then we connected to CMC. Dr. Jacob Chakogar has come all the way and spent time there and we made a roster and we managed the patient there in the, our setup for almost two weeks and could discharge the patient in good health. And more peripheral surgeries, surgical endocrinology, spine surgeries we have started. You can see a small microscope there that was that's parked in a hospital because of the generosity of one of our batchmates, Dr. Shakuntala, who is practicing new ENT surgeon in Hyderabad. That's a small theater that we have, which is a small theater, but that's where all this work is happening. We started some basic brain surgeries, and we have a small rehab center. So our costs at present in Unicorpus, compared to the costs outside, are so normal delivery is 13,000, LSCS is 25,000, hysterectomy is 35,000. Coming to the super specialty, I just quoted the cost of the surgeries where I am involved. The spine costs 80,000, the brain surgery costs 1 lakh. So how do we reduce this cost? This is what I just want to focus upon. So one is to deliberately remove the medical mafia from the loop, which is a difficult, but it's possible. 
because we believe that we are not alone in this battle and we have the hand of the living God with us. And trust in friends and like-minded people. And I'm proud to say that a lot of people sitting here from various batches have been part of this wonderful journey of faith. There are people from batch of 96 who are sitting here, Dr. Mary, Dr. Paul Levin, and other David and other people. And the senior batches and junior batches who are with us in our walk, this, in our walk thus far. And reduce the cost of the surgeon and anesthetist because that's what did, uh, decides the bill of a patient in private sector. And take help from seniors and mentors. And I'm happy to say that when we started this hospital, some of the people sitting here were part of the inaugural program, Dr. Ingaru and uh, Dr. Priya, who's the uh, General Secretary of uh, CMA, Winsley Rose. They're all part of uh, our uh, inaugural program for the hospital. Join hands with those who are in need. So we are right now in uh, discussions with small mission hospitals at, like Umri and uh, Asha Kiran Hospital, CSA, uh, Karimnagar, Kamam, CSA, Kamam hospitals to join hands with them so that we can do these surgeries in their setups at, at a reasonable cost and optimize the profit that we get on various items and cross subsidy if it is possible and raise donations from individuals or families. This is, this is very much possible because the case I had shown the bladder extrophy was possible because we raised donations from some some companies around and from some individuals and also by making training a part of this because I think if you train people like nurse assistants, pharmacy assistants, it's possible to retain them for a longer time. That will definitely decrease the burden of uh, that, the financial burden in terms of salaries because that's where one problem that we are seeing is that the people of current generation, they talk about service, they talk about service-minded uh, things, but they're not really service-minded. At the end of the day, they want a good salary. So I think training is to, has to be part of this to make these things possible. The challenges, yes, we face challenges. We are facing challenges. One has been the COVID pandemic. We started the hospital in 2020, January, and immediately within now uh, three months, we had the first wave, then second wave, third wave. It has been a big uh, obstacle for us, but then God gave us grace and support in those, in those times, during those times to overcome that. And then medical mafia, I guess, as long as the human heart is greedy, we will continue to fight this battle. And we believe that it is not a battle of a single person. It has to be a battle of a group of dedicated people who understand the needs of uh, middle-class families who need affordable health care. And a group that needs support from institutions like CMC. And we're blessed because a lot of people in CMC directly or indirectly have been uh, guiding us, supporting us, strengthening us, praying for us. So challenges from inside. It's easy to talk about like-minded people, but sometimes, you know, it's difficult to find. You, you think the people around you are like-minded, but they're not so. And we have a lot of comfort Christians around us who find it very difficult to understand the meaning of real giving. And sometimes we feel alone, like, you know, that as we diabetes, no diabetes, it's like, you know, starvation amidst of plenty. So a lot of plenty of Christian doctors around or like-minded people around, but you feel that you're lonely. Because many of people have forgot the art of giving. And for those who are in missions, we forgot understanding the real meaning of being a disciple in medical missions. So we believe that God is working through this model that is unfolding. We are not connected to any particular church. We are completely not for profit. We are urban based right now, but connecting to rural setups and mission rural hospitals and mission hospitals. And we are working on pooling of resources. This has been a journey of faith from the beginning. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm happy that I had the support of my batchmates and various other batches who are sitting here who understood the need and are supporting us in various ways. And we believe that as this model unfolds, we believe that God is going to do wonderful things through Unicopper Health Foundation. How do we face challenges? We consider it as a joy when we face this challenge. 
pray and participate because we believe that God is already at work and we just have to join him in his work and sincerely claim the promises that God speaks to you in your personal meditation or through other people. And critics, I believe they are like catfish in our life. We are those who are meant to make us more strong in our journey. Firmly but gently respond to the dark forces that always try to disturb the work of the living God. Future, we are looking forward to upgrade our 25-bedded hospital to 50-bedded hospital. We are looking for its uh, separate ortho, neuro, OT. And ophthalmology services are coming up. And as I said, we started as a geriatric center and we have passion for geriatric and we want to start a standalone geriatric center. Trauma center move from level three to level two, work with other, other hospitals and continue training as, uh, continue to train people and continue to understand the meaning of this training. I'd like to stop here and thank all of you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Samson, for that lucid presentation. Thank you. Uh, open for questions. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. So I believe it's okay. Thank you. I, I really want to commend you for what you're doing. Thank you. And um, I think it's something very unique that we're doing. Everybody knows about the medical mafia, but then none of us wants to do anything about it because we just think it's just too difficult. But if New York could get rid of its mafia, I think we can get rid of our mafia as well. And you've shown the way. I came in a bit late, so I'm, I don't know whether you've already mentioned it. I'm so happy to see that you're uh, thinking of geriatrics because that's something only those who deal with older people know how there's a wealth of miseries yes. that they have. And nobody can understand it till they go through it themselves. But I also felt that you were... Not having you were you are more um, surgery based. Yes, I think yeah. because of who the you team are. that is yeah, there. The yes. team. But I think more than surgery, it is the primary care which is so important. For example, somebody who gets a bad attack of asthma in a corporate hospital will end up paying lakhs. You know, that's just inexcusable. I'm working in one such hospital and I can't just understand it myself. So I think there's a huge place for you or many other people also for us to start the primary urban primary care in urban areas at least going to the rural seems to be such a big step for many of us but can we at least do it in the urban areas and since you've shown the path i'm sure there'll be others to follow thank you thank you ma'am for that question thank you ma'am for your comment and i'd like to say that geriatrics is a part of our journey and we have Dr. Shaw, Shaw Wallace, who's trained in geriatrics from CMC, who's part of our team and he conducts camps for geriatrics. And in this 25-bedded hospital, I focused on the affordable surgical care, but we do cater to primary care. And there's a, there's a team of doctors who take care of community health care in the surrounding uh, villages. Thank you, ma'am. Any more questions? Just one more question. Yes, uh, so this model that you have, uh, you're working on, uh, how is it different from CMC's model of not-for-profit and uh, are the costs comparable? Yes. Uh, one way it's different is that we have, we have registered it as a complete uh, secular NGO, number one. Number two is uh, we are, uh, in terms of cost, I think the general bed costs are matched with what we are doing, maybe not the semi-private and private because the, we have a small setup of 25 bedded, so we really have only one or two uh, rooms which we can call as uh, semi-deluxe or deluxe rooms. So if no more questions, then thank you, uh, Dr. Samson. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, cheers for silver and blue, and God bless us all. Thank you. So we would like to present a certificate of appreciation to you.
So our third and final speaker is uh, Dr. Arun Kumar. He's from the batch of 1985, and he's also the king of their batch. So we have many kings today. Uh, after MBBS, he pursued MCH neurosurgery in CMC Bellaw and did DNB in neurosurgery. Uh, presently, he is a director of neurosciences and chief neurosurgeon, chairman and managing director of Hannah Joseph Hospital in Madurai, Tamil Nadu. Uh, he's uh, authored many publications. He's also an examiner for DNB exam. And uh, he's presently into neuro navigation, intraoperative angiography, ultrasound, neuro monitoring. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. MJ Arun Kumar. Four and five, where the GCS is pretty much low. Then the recent 10 to 10, 15 years, various institutes all over the world, they started doing the recent, I uh, mean, the early surgeries for poor grade patients. So we just want to see what's happening in the poor grade patients. Um, so we just go about the advantages of early surgery. It virtually eliminates the risk of rebleeding facilitated treatment of vasospasm, which peaks between six to eight days post SAH, allowing induction of arterial hypertension and volume expansion without the fear of irreversible rupture. It also allows lavage to remove vasospasmogenic agents from contacted blood vessels. Although the operative mortality is higher, the overall patient mortality is lower, low. The challenges faced are because of the inflammation and brain edema. These are worst and very severe immediately following his age. It needs more brain retraction. Retractors tend to lacerate the soft and friable brain. The presence of solid clots in the supracranial space impedes surgery. Risk of intraoperative rupture is higher with earlier surgery. Incidence of vasospasm in, is higher due to surgical handling of the vessels during surgery. So how we overcome prompt and judicial use of mannitol, diuretics, and steroids, which is debatable, but I use it. This can overcome the brain edema and inflammation, careful placement of retractable, retractable blades without breaching the pyarachnoid covering the cortical surfaces, gentle handling of vessels, particularly while dissecting the subarachnoid spaces, a good and neuroanesthesiology team to back up so that the wild fluctuations in blood pressure and heart rate are avoided, and this can prevent intraoperative rupture. The, the checklist is a perioperative management is what we'd all do everywhere. It is a stabilizing patient, elective intubation and ventilation if GCS is less than eight, anti edema measures, and initiate treatment towards vasospasm and hydrocephalus, correcting the associated cardiac and pulmonary complications of severe SAH, Arterial BP, CVP, and other vital parameters monitoring. So, I just want to present a few um, cases to say how this early surgery in uh, poor grade patients do on. Here we uh, see a 62 year old lady presented with headache and vomiting, GCS of 11 by 15, WFNS grade 4. CT brain shows SAH grade 2, and clipping was done 20, in less than 24 hours. The show the CT of the brain showing SAH here. You can see the subcranial blood and the hydrocephalus early temporal hall dilatation. We can also the score is low because we see the intraventricular hemorrhages here, and we go ahead with an angiography where we see a bilobed aneurysm racing from the acom uh, junction, and uh, it's from the left anterior artery going on the acom. And uh, show the microsurgical picture of this. We just see the angry brain and swollen brain with the subarachnoid hemorrhage. The left sylvian dissection is the left temporal lobe. We gently keep going with the dissection of the sylvian cistern from proximal to distal. And you can see this uh, fresh CSF uh, stained with blood keeps coming out even while operating in a very small space. The retractor blades also should be placed gently. Further dissection 
carried on to expose the optic system. The left optic nerve is exposed there. The arachnoid is further incised and dissected to expose the left internal carotid artery. And going on to the supracellular system, then the aneurysmal complex, the A1, A2 are the anterior arteries branches. The A is aneurysm there. You can see the blood just keeps coming into your field. That's all the CSF, which is stained with blood. And you prepare the place, usually the neck of the aneurysm dome for your application of the clip. We do an intraoperative intraoperative angiography to further delineate this place to see the aneurysm and move the vessels to see whether there's any other ves vessels and uh, perforators are coming on the way. You also do a flow 800, which shows the fl flow velocity. Clip is applicate, applied across the neck and looking at the opposite A2, post-operative intraop angiography to make sure the clip is in position and the aneurysm is excluded from the circulation. Flow velocity unaltered, no in intraoperative vasospasm is gone. Hemostatic agents applied in the sylvian and this shows uh, follow-up MR, follow-up MR angiogram with no aneurysm. This lady, a two months follow-up. It's so another patient with the, the last one is uh, uh, grade four and this is a grade five. Extensive uh, subcranial hemorrhage, almost supracellar assistance the, and uh, sylvian assistance everywhere. There's blood there. You see there's a ACOM, another ACOM bilobed aneurysm erasing from the, from the dominant right ACA. There's a 3D uh, angiography, which we see, we're just showing a large aneurysm there. And uh, further, what is the important thing is we have the cerebral ediba so much, the working area is so little, friable brain, extensive blood in the cisterns. And we always look at how to do your dissection, which is minimally invasive. And uh, and uh, see that you get to look at the neck, which you need to clip, not the dome or anywhere. So what we do is uh, we can go into the gantry and rotate the images in such a way to optimize the, to see the neck where this aneurysm there, so that you can rotate and see, here you can see a ROA, that is right and anterior oblique is about 16 degrees you need to rotate. Caudal tilt is about 16 degrees. So when you do that, we get to see the neck without the dome or any other perfect or anything else that comes in your view so that you can easily come out of this uh, surgery after putting in the clip. So accordingly, based on that, we can also position your um, head um, that, you know, that uh, 16 degree tilt towards the left side and cranial coral tilts about another 16 degrees. So this is a grade five area. So this is how, how it looks when you open. It's a very angry brain, red. And you're still wondering how to go about, you know, like so a lot of times it feels like you back out. These are things which have happened about uh, two decades back when we try not to go in for early surgery. We want to, you know, like you want to give a and uh, nimodipin and all those drugs to uh, soften his brain and to make the patient improve and then go in for an easy surgery. Nowadays, we don't do that because of fear of re-rupture. So we are dissecting there, the right optic nerve and the right internal carotid artery. Then you see the, as I showed you in the, the images where, where uh, we see in that uh, gantry, the same thing is evident when you go and operate. Small area, and you see in here the ICA, the internal carotid artery, the optic nerve on the right side, the A1 and the A2. And you're right there with the dome, similar to the picture. And the next picture you can see, you can just need to go, neck is visible, put the clip there, come out, that's it. So it, it makes things much easier. So even the intraoperative angiography, when you do that, it is evident that what you see on the gantry preoperatively is seen intraoperatively and it also shows the flow velocity and intensity of the, the thing here. So again, the clip is applied. This also shows 
the the intensity and uh, the flow velocity using the software available in the microscope, the thing doesn't change. And it's not changed see, saying that it's not gone into vasospasm. This is a post of, I mean, after clipping. And you see how the after dissecting and after letting out all the CSF which contains the blood products, which are the potential vasogenic agents, is now the, the brain is sort of supple and it's sort of lying down. And this is how it is before we close. This is scan, the first post of day. All patients we do, the brain looks quite lax. This is another interesting thing, like just to say, why don't not to avoid, even in very poor grade patients, not to avoid um, as, uh, immediate surgery and try to postpone as long as the patient is hemodynamically all right and the patient is willing for surgery. This is a middle-aged lady was found in the bus depot after all the passengers left the um, bus terminal. Somebody took her to the hospital. By the time they, they did a scan in the government hospital and they found the subarachnoid hemorrhage was there. By the time they referred within 24 hours, she had a rebleed. Jesus, GCS was three by 15, pupils mid-size, sluggishly reacting. BP was 80 by 60. We start on inotropic supports. Within the next 24 hours, she improved hemodynamically. So in 48 hours time, we, can, we had to go ahead. There's a patient, poor GCS, 3 by 15, hemodynamically unstable, but made to be, become stable, going ahead and there's a right middle cerebral artery and some which is small, but it's potentially it is breaking the second time. So this one, if you see the intraoperative, you don't see the aneurysm. You can see the right internal carotid artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery going there. Middle cerebral artery bifurcation, you see there's a, one black stuff there because this intraop agios, Unless the dome is clear, it will not pick up the contrast like that. But by, by, by microscopic view, you can see that because the, the clot is there, the, the angio will not show that. So after clipping, we have done the repeat angio. After you can see the clip here, we also see another bleb here. You can see a small bleb there, and we had to put the second clip there. The first clip across, the bleb, again, second clip. Now you see the angio. The aneurysm is excluded from the circulation. Then the closure, brain is sort of less tense, and the angry brain is because of the rebleed within 40 days. And now, this is just to show this graph is very important, which we see in drop. This shows the flow attendant thing where this flow velocity reduces after the clipping. And after using in drop papaverin patches, the flow velocity increases. This also in so one more minute. Yeah, we uh, uh, have this uh, ang uh, graphic which tends to have the perfusion is here, it goes down and regains back. It's a post op uh, uh, CT, and the lady after three months back to normal to the clinic. So, analytic data just a few slides. Retrospective analysis about uh, in April 2009 to Jan 22, 56 patients all about 18 years. Um, these are things we've done, clipped within 72 hours. GCS, G, GOS done at six months. Total number of patients, 123. WFNS or microsurgical clipping is 109. And poor grade patients are 56. The distribution of the poor grade patients. Aneurysm location, mostly middle cerebral artery and anti-communicating artery. Timing of surgery, mostly 57% in less than 24 hours. Vasospasm, highest in eight to 10 days and 11 to 14 days. Cause of death is due to severe vasospasm. In Glasgow out outcome scale, we found that most of the patients had a good outcome and it's comparable to the recent studies, outcome of a good outcome of 67% and the death rate of around 23%. In conclusion, Early aneurysmal clipping and aggressive postoperative critical care management reduces morbidity, mortality, even in poor grade patients, reduces risk of re-rupture and its consequences. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Arun, for that very enlightening presentation. The, it's open for questions now. So are there any other centers that do this procedure? And how are the outcomes comparable? In, in, uh, in South, uh, there are centers which do this, but uh, the inappropriate angiography is not available there. But however, our institute here, they routinely do this uh, surgery. I think they are here also, we, we do here in the last 10, 12 years, all the uh, poor grade patients which are approached with early surgeries is there. And this is a really good outcome everywhere, yeah. Thank you, sir. Any further questions? Yes. Ma'am, to the mic. What is the role of interventional radiology in these cases? Interventional, ma'am. Yeah, I mean... Coiling. Coiling. Yes, ma'am. See, um, the thing is, in the interventional uh, 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 role is like in poor grade patients. Nowadays, it's mainly becoming the patient's choice. Some people want uh, interventional radiology, some want surgery, but the, if there is a hematoma associated with aneurysms, it's better dealt with surgery rather than interventions. Also surgery eliminates all the blood in the systems, thereby prevents further vasospasm. So the outcome can be much better in microsurgical clipping. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arun Kumar. We would like to present to you a certificate of appreciation. Uh, special thanks for uh, all the batches for giving us such an interesting CME, which uh, ranged right from uh, surgical speciality in urban setup to super speciality surgery and to artificial intelligence in Singapore. So I think we covered the whole gamut. Thank you very much. And uh, sincere thanks to the chairperson, Dr. Susina, and the co-chair, Dr. Divya. Uh, I would like to give a small token of our appreciation to Dr. Sushina. And to Dr. Divya Mulil. Uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce the speakers of the CME for today. The first speaker is from the batch of 1986, uh, Dr. Thomas Arun Vargis. After finishing his MBBS, he did his MS Ophthalmology in CMC Wellow, and then he went on to uh, get his fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons. He's also done a glaucoma fellowship. His special interests are in glaucoma and neuro-ophthalmology, especially in selective laser trabeculoplasty, scanning laser polarometry, and post-operative astigmatism. Uh, he's a recipient of many awards. He has several publications to his credit, uh, and he's also a reviewer of many academic boards. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Thomas Arun Vergis. respected teachers and dear CMC family. It is a great privilege here to be standing, representing my batch, the batch of 1986. I'll get straight down to my topic. The thought I would like to share with you is don't miss the big picture. You've got the picture of Sherlock Holmes here, and you can, you'll see shortly why. Specialization is here to stay, but are we missing the tree from its branch, for its branches? Should we be more cautious about over-specializing? We had great teachers, and they've always emphasized the importance of looking at the patient as a whole. And in CMC, we always go one step further, not just looking after the physical and mental needs, but even at the spiritual needs. And that is where I think we can, have, we can be different from the corporate hospitals. 
In, in ophthalmology, we have eight specialities. You can see here oculoplasty, neuroophthalmology. My, my favorites are neuroophthalmology and glaucoma. And I understand soon it's going to become 16 specialities, right eye and left eye. <laughs> I practice oculoplasty, neuroophthalmology, glaucoma, uveitis and medical retina, and most of us do cataract. You all heard the term jack of all trades, master of none. Well, I strive to be jack of all trades, master of some. Two ophthalmologists I'd like to bring your attention, attention to here. Can you, any of you identify the person on the left? Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. He was, that tells us he was a very keen observer and a very inquisitive mind. And to your right, Dr. Lee Wen Liang, in recent times, he was the ophthalmologist who first noticed or seven cons consecutive patients with conjunctivitis and respiratory symptoms, and he was working in Wuhan. And all these patients came from the animal market in Wuhan, and he rammed the alarm bells, saying there is a new SARS-like virus around, and we warned his colleagues. He was silenced by the Chinese authorities, and unfortunately succumbed to COVID in February 2020. So ophthalmologists are keen observers. Our tools, you know, Holmes has his tools, we have our tools, special lenses, a slit lamp, uh, two eyes, and also our ears, and what is between our ears. Looking beyond the eye is so important in ophthalmology. Sometimes the current practice is often missed. You have this patient here, 35 year old, six weeks of headache and decreased vision, left eye, and you can see the left disc edema. And if you put the patient back and have a look, you can see that fullness of the temporal fossa, and that was due to fibrous dysplasia. So very often the clue is outside the eyeball. Another patient here, a 40 year old, with complaint of blurring of vision, double vision, and you can see the intraocular pressure was 40. And I saw this car on the forehead, and you ask the history, she fell off her scooter, ridden by a 14 year old son, and had a fairly significant head injury, and six months down the line, she developed these eye symptoms, and this was due to a carotico cavernous fistula. Shows us so important, why it's important to look beyond the eye. In this COVID times, again, this patient with a unilateral red eye and increased pressure, you lower the mask and you see the port wine stain of Sturge Weber syndrome. So just illustrating to you with a few cases why it is so important to keep the patient in mind as a whole and very often systemic conditions present to ophthalmologists with the first complaint. 13 year old business manager, manager of a cement company present with a complaint of blind sp brown spot in the front of his left eye for one week. He's a strict vegetarian and he had, his weight was over 100 kilos and he decided to go on a strict diet. He lost 10 kilos in three months and recently he had started weight training. And you can see he had a hemorrhage in the left eye, pre-retinal hemorrhage, which is what the cause of his complaint was. So I told him, this is most likely due to your weight training, so just you can ease off the weight training, you can continue your diet, you continue your treadmill and your running, that's fine, but stay off weights. That was his vision. And he said, fine. But two weeks later, he came with exactly the same symptoms in the right eye. And you can see the fundus picture here, pretty much exactly the same findings. And then I knew it was something else going on as he had completely stayed off the weight training. So going back to the history, he said he was feeling weak for the last month. I do his blood counts and you can see hemoglobin of four. And he was referred to a neuroophthalmologist. I knew this was a certainly a hematological problem. An investigation showed a very low B12 and vitamin D and a platelet count of 43,000. So this turned out to be a case of megaloblastic anemia with vitamin D deficiency. And fortunately, with the right treatment, he steadily got better. Again, a systemic condition presenting to the ophthalmologist with the first complaint. So keep your whole patient in mind, not just the eyes. The second case is a 59-year-old shopkeeper. He complains of decreased vision in both eyes for two weeks. You can see I'm seeing him during the COVID times. He's a diabetic for 15 years, and the best vision equity you can see 636 N12. So he's seen first by our uh, retina consultant, and she had noted a sluggish pupil, but did not realize the significance of it at that point in time. That was the fundus photograph. You can see there was uh, significant retinopathy in the left eye, but hardly any changes in the right eye. But vision was reduced in both eyes. 
So there's significant diabetic retinopathy and maculopathy, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and we also did a particular scan of the eye that we do to see if there's any swelling of the macula. And again, that was there in the left eye, but right eye was pretty normal. So we had a patient with asymmetric retinopathy, but vision was equally reduced in both eyes. And fluorescent angiogram, we often do, because sometimes you can get what is a macular ischemia. So poor blood flow to the macula, with hardly any retinal changes when you actually examine, but vision can be reduced. But again, fluorescent angiogram, angiography ruled out macular ischemia. But there was definite proliferative retinopathy. So our retina consultant pro proceeded with panretinal photocoagulation, and as, but she did feel that the vision didn't quite correlate with the fundus findings. And so she did an MRI, which was normal. Also sent for a second opinion to a higher senior retinal consultant who, also, who said probably a diabetic papillopathy, that is a certain optic nerve changes you get, get in diabetics, and such a course of short, short course of systemic steroids. So again, that was given for four weeks, but still vision was steadily getting worse. And so the retina consultant asked me to have a look as I practiced neuroophthalmology. You can see the vision was steadily dropping, 660 N36. And sometimes, some things the patients say, just strike a bell in your mind. He told me, I can see blue colored objects better. My central vision is blurred, but my periphery is brighter. And these things sometimes just ring a bell. So he had a problem with his color vision from what he said, and he could just about see the first control plate of, a, of the Ishihara color vision chart and the field test showed a marked depression of his vision. So now we had a cluster of findings, vision was reduced, color vision was affected, and you go back to the initial re recording of a sluggish pupil, and of course, depressed visual fields. And this cluster of findings actually indicate an optic neuropathy rather than the uh, diabetic retinopathy. So his actual reduction in vision was due to the optic neuropathy. And now our task was to find the cause for the optic neuropathy. Was it toxic, nutritional, drug-induced? So I was racking my brains, and then I had saw this patient, he had a small plaster on his right ankle. I said, what is this about? And he said, oh, he had an ankle fracture a few years ago, and uh, the screws were put, and then some have been removed, but he had got an infection, and this was an MRSA infection, and then he had been started on this tab, linozolid, uh, 600 milligrams a day. So you, linozolid is given for MRSA infection, usually for a four weeks, sometimes two months course, but not on a long-term basis. And he had been, ha I was seeing the patient in August 2020, so he'd been on it for almost 14 months. So now we got our diagnosis, linozolid induced optic neuropathy, plus of course, the diabetic retinopathy. And you can see here, the timeline of events from when the linozolid was started and when his vision started reducing. So some of our patients present a mystery, like a Sherlock Holmes case, and if it is up to us to take our time, look at the patient as a whole, and then we can come to a favorable conclusion for both us and for the patient. So sometimes the clue is on the face, sometimes it's on the forehead, sometimes it's on the foot. And you can see, the, with the appropriate treatment, we just substituted linozolid, gave a vitamin B complex, and I saw him just a few months ago, mainly to monitor the diabetic retinopathy, and he's got a fairly good vision of 6-12, 6-9, and good near vision. So lessons from these cases is most important. Use ophthalmologists, we should use our ears a bit more, listen to the patient, keep an open mind, and thereby, there can be more than one pathology. Always you need to look beyond the eye if you cannot find an answer, and where necessary, go back to the history. I would like to acknowledge Professor Rebi Thomas, who was a great teacher and inspired three of our batch, Dr. Aradhana Singh, who practices in Pune, and Dr. Leka Abraham. I'm very proud to say is here, and the HOD Ophthalmology CMC Velo. <laughs> Leka tells me that the present three units is going to become six units shortly, not necessarily because of right and left, but for other reasons. <laughs> so I conclude by saying, your patient may have tunnel vision, but make sure you don't have tunnel vision. Don't miss the big picture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that interesting presentation. It's open for questions now. 
I work in Cochin, madam, and I visit four, three other hospitals outside Cochin. He's a consultant in Alexander Eye Center at Nakula, St. Joseph Hospital, Kanyarapalli, and Alfonso Eye Hospital, Torubura. Any questions? Okay. One Thank from you. me. Thank you. So, so you have said a lot of systemic uh, uh, abnormalities are first detected, uh, probably the patient presents first with eye symptoms. So can you tell us of any of the community glaucoma initiatives that have been taken by the Kerala, Kerala or the Tamil Nadu governments? As you know, there have been, there have been studies, uh, especially the Shankar Netralaya, more, more in uh, Tamil Nadu rather than Kerala, I would say. And also in Belor, we know we have the value community eye survey, mainly looking at angle closure glaucoma, because very often our, our patients don't present like a typical acute angle closure glaucoma. They develop what is known as a creeping angle closure. And these can only be found out by community surveys, because by the time the patient develops symptoms and comes to us, it is often too late. And as you know, blindness due to glaucoma is irreversible unless that blindness due to cataract. Any further questions? If not, then thank you, Dr. Arunkumar, for your wonderful much. presentation. I request Dr. Alfred to give a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Arunkumar. Our next speaker is from the batch of 1981, Dr. Prabir Kumar Chatterjee. After doing his MD in community medicine from CMC Velo, he began training village level workers. During 1986, he worked in Tirupatur and Elagiri areas. Back in West Bengal, he trained health workers in Santal Parganas, Purba Bardwan, Uttar Dinajpur, and Chhattisgarh over the years. His primary focus area in rural healthcare is the early detection, prevention, and cure of tuberculosis malaria, and Kalazar. He has worked in childhood immunization and maternal health for over 30 years, including four years as polio surveillance officer in Goda, Jharkhand, and six years as district immunization consultant, UNICEF, in West Bengal. Prabir joined Amader Haspatal in June 2020 as a physician and trainer. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Prabir Kumar Chatterjee. Good morning to everybody in CMC and all the alumni present as well. Uh, today I'm going, going to talk about uh, our privilege or privilege in general and discrimination in healthcare, in health, let's say. So I'm starting uh, with a picture of where tribes live in India. And uh, you can see on this that there's a large concentration of tribes in the Northeast. There's a large concentration in Ladakh and a large concentration here in Lakshwadeep. But actually the numbers of tribals in India are mostly in the areas surrounding this green spot. So other than the Northeast tribals, a large number of tribals in India are what we call the Central Indian tribals. And though Central India is mostly thought of as Chhattisgarh and uh, Jharkhand, Actually, the numbers are much larger in Maharashtra and in Madhya Pradesh, in Orissa, Gujarat, Rajasthan, West Bengal, Assam, states that we don't traditionally associate with tribals. Uh, so we're looking at tribals because they're considered a very underprivileged group, and there are large numbers of them. I just showed you that number, 105 million tribals in India. It's not a small number. And I'm showing you a bit of the statistics, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. That is comparative literacy between tribals and the rest of India. And you can see that tribals caught up to the 1961 literacy level only in 1991. 30 years later, they reached this 29.6%, which all of India had in 1961. And we've been catching up a little faster after that. Tribals are now at 58.96% literacy, which is roughly what India, the rest of India was in 1991. So we're now only 20% behind the rest of India. 
The third, uh, 20 years behind. The third thing that I'm giving as household statistics, rather this is the second in uh, numbers, in Jharkhand, we've got huge variations in uh, access to toilets. One of those social characteristics that are required. And in the district of Dumka, there at the bottom, you find that uh, only 49% of people in rural areas, where Santals are really largely concentrated. I, I put that slide which showed that uh, Draupadi Munmo is a Santal, who's the president of India today. Only 49% of people in rural Dumka have got access to toilets. Whereas, and this slide's a little out of focus, uh, in that state, in uh, Jharkhand, uh, as much as 91% of people have toilets in Rachi. Now I'm giving you a health indicator. And uh, here I'm going a little further down to the particularly vulnerable tribal groups like the Pahadias and the very, very small tribal groups who are considered even worse off than the average tribal. And here we're using uh, neonatal mortality rates. Simple reason that we've gone beyond, let's say, IMR and the normal uh, statistics. So for most of India, we're looking at, or the world, we're looking at neonatal mortality rates. And for the more privileged, and for even the other backward castes, the NMR in this particular district in Jharkhand, where the survey was done by Ekjur, 31 per thousand. Whereas the PBTGs were almost double at 59 per thousand. And the average tribal in that area, the Santals and people like that, were about 44 per thousand. So there are massive differences, and I think we all know about this. There's nothing new. The question is, how do we look at this and how do we change this? And this, we're going to be much, uh, you know, less medical stuff. Why might this be so? And I'm looking at a person called Paul Farmer, who's an anthropologist. He died recently. I think he had COVID also. He was there in Africa. And he says one answer is that the poor are not only more likely to suffer, to die, to be sick, that we know. They are also, and we don't think about this, more likely to have their suffering silenced. Now the question that has been raised is being raised by a CMCite, well known to many of you. Glenn Christo is how we call him. Many of you would know Johnny, Johnny Christo. And he asks the questions, he now uses his maternal surname, like other people in Shillong, Glenn Kharkongor. And he asks the question, this was recently, I think, a Harvard uh, South Asia uh, conference online. And he asked a very interesting question. How can we build in elements of agency and autonomy so that tribal people are actually participating in the discussion? He's saying something very, I don't think he'd read, he might have, he's very well read. Uh, I don't know whether he read Paul Farmer, but he's saying the same thing, that tribal people are not participating in the discourses. It is other people like us who are representing the state establishment, policy actors, you know, these big doctors or administrators, and the people who do the research, the knowledge generators. Tribals themselves are not speaking. This is beautiful, and it was published later in uh, the Shillong Times, a day or two later. I had a chance to talk to him, I had not realized that he has spent a lot of time in childhood. His father was a missionary among Santals in uh, Jharkhand. And he says that when he was a teenager, must have come back from Spicer and visiting his father, he saw dead bodies of people on the road. He saw famine in Jharkhand. So he's really seen it at close quarters. I, I had no idea there was a major... Uh, starvation deaths in the 60s when we were young. He's older than us. Talking about it, uh, unfortunately the slide is a bit uh, jumbled. Somebody doing her under undergraduate research in the USA, and she talks about it. She calls it social marginalization of the marginalization of the other. And she took three case studies to represent, if, uh, represent three different types of cases of othering. One is the case of the Romani whom we talk about, we call them gypsies, they don't call themselves gypsies anymore, in Europe. One, a case of religious uh, othering, where the Shias are looked down upon by the Sunnis in Saudi Arabia. 
And the third is of a socially constructed group in India, and you can guess. I've actually deleted the actual reference, not to upset people. But she says that if this violence has to be remedied, and this is curious because, again, I don't think she could have come into touch with Glenn Kharkongor except when he was doing his postgraduate, and she was probably a small child at that time. She says for the violence, and she also uses the word violence, to be remedied, there must be first a greater integration of other persons into the educational system. And then she describes what she means by other or the out group, the people whom the majority push into being different. So I've taken a, a little piece. You'll get the whole thing if you get the whole presentation. Uh, this is a lady. I recently visited Rachi uh, on my way to Gumla, where somebody wanted to set up a telemedicine setup. And I visited a friend of mine, and I said, I might be talking on this topic. And he said, ah, there's a very No, at that time, I wasn't talking about talking here. We have a meeting in Medigo Friends Circle, which is discussing some of these issues. And he said, I know somebody's just written something. And she's a poet, a very well-known uh, poet in Hindi, an Orao lady in uh, Rachi. And she'd been in a hospital in Rachi, the Rachi Institute of Medical Sciences. She was lying on the floor outside the wards. Her sister was admitted. And she was just watching people, and she's written about it. I'm in Rim's hospital, she says. She's written in Hindi uh, for three days, watching people, listening to people. And she says that on the first day, she sees this trainee doctor in the maternity ward screaming at a pregnant woman. I mean, I've done this also. Ah, keep having child after child. You don't take any precautions. Ah, tra another trainee doctor being very angry with another woman. Don't say anything. I've got okat nahi hai is what they say in Hindi. Mera okat hai, I'm doctor hai. And later, there's a description in this piece that uh, Jacinta Kerketa has written where she says that a lady had to go from the postnatal ward to what must be the NICU, she doesn't call them that, to give breast milk. Obviously, the child in the NICU still needs breast milk. Middle of the night, doctor said go. She finds the gates closed. And she finds that this person is not there, the gatekeeper, a lady. She's gone to chat with another lady somewhere in the hospital. Middle of the night. And the uh, guard comes back, this lady guard. And this woman is screaming, I want to give the child the milk type of a thing. And the guard shouts back, and she says, everybody is talking like this. We are what? Kira, Makore? Are we just insects? That we have no right to speak? Curious, no? The Jacinta Kerkata, looking at it as a tribal, sitting in the hospital, sees the same thing that the other two or three people have mentioned. Now I'll come towards the end, I mean, the time will uh, beat fairly. Ah, beat. So, <laughs> the steady drumbeat of institutional casteism is a little report that came out recently. It's about a lady called Payal Thadbi. I'm sure you've heard about her. A gynecology resident. She was in her first year postgraduate. And she committed suicide because of the way she was treated in Bombay by other obstetric uh, postgraduates. And they're asking the question, do we recognize Casteism for what it is. She was a tribal, huh? but they're calling it casteism. Do we respond? And how do we redress it? I leave you with three questions, and that's all I want to say. Are there still oppressive social privileges in India? Which communities are discriminated against in India? I, I leave it to you to ask the questions. Does India have a public health crisis like racism? See, there's a quote out here from the, it's not a quotation, it's a link. American Public Health Association has got a web page where they've got hundreds of municipalities all around America who have declared racism as a public health issue in America. So the questions that are being asked to us by people from scheduled caste and scheduled type uh, backgrounds throughout India is should we declare casteism in India as a public health crisis? Question to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prabhi, for that enlightening presentation. Uh, it's an honor for all of us Indians to have uh, Ms. Draupadi Momo as the first Santal woman president. Uh, the house is open for questions. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, can you come to the mic?
Thank you very much for that very informative and insightful um, uh, talk. Um, I'm specifically interested in Glenn Christo's statement on how we build in elements into the agency so that people take responsibility for their health and their well-being. Would you be able to offer any views? Well, I talked to Glenn. I sent him uh, an earlier version of this presentation. Glenn said, if you're going there up on the stage, can you ask CMC if they'd like to introduce students to the question of tribal health? Maybe just say justice in health. I, I prefer to say justice in health, because I think casteism is another issue. I put a few questions or reflections on uh, CMC here on the slide. I'm not talking about it. But I have a feeling that 40, 50 years ago when we came here, there were elements of this even here. It may have changed huh, over the 40 years. I have a feeling when I look at it that these things have changed. But should we be introducing our students among the other programs, those students who want to, to the questions in this institution or in the country, this may be one way. Because there are tribal students. There are scheduled caste students or people from less privileged backgrounds in every medical college in the country. It's not restricted to any particular medical college or any particular institution. So let them speak. People are committing suicide in JNU. People are committing suicide in IT, IITs all the time. And large numbers of these suicides are among people from backward communities, so-called backward community, people whom we've othered. That's my suggestion. Uh, actually, I'd like an opinion from you, Prabhupada. Uh, don't you think this casteism or this, uh, you know, whatever we call it, tribal, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the, is inbuilt within the society in India? Let, now, let me see why. Even among the scheduled tribes or, you know, other backward classes, let's take in Bihar, I believe there's a tribe who are called the rat eaters. And I'm told that the other tribals treat them as, you know, even the lowest of the lowest caste or whatever it is. So isn't this something that is you know, ingrained in, through so many years of, uh, and the, therefore overcoming that is going to be that much of a challenge? So that's a question. How many more years? 30 years? 20 years? Or does it also depend on recognizing where the issues are? If we don't recognize where the issues are, So could you some pointers to that, where the issues are? Ah. So, uh, I wish I had the particular slide by Paul Farmer that showed uh, why he calls it structural violence. He says it's structural because it's created by the organizations of our society, by the government of our society. It's created by the institutions. He calls it violence because people are being injured by it. Some person is dying or getting sick because of it. So the two questions are, what is wrong in our institution? Whether it's a medical college or it's a nation as such, what is wrong in the institution that divides people into these two groups? You are talking about the Musahars in Bihar. They're not a tribe, I believe, they're a scheduled caste. But anyhow, it doesn't matter whether they're a tribe or a community. The point is they're othered very badly. They're treated very badly. It's not that they eat rats, actually. The other communities who eat rats, that's not a asset. It's a form of meat. Ah, but they're so poor that they go to the rat holes and scrape rice grain that the rats have, they're that poor. Why have they been made that poor? I once visited an area in Darbhanga and people told me that uh, there was supposed to have been a flood and uh, uh, the Musahas were living on the edges of the dams that are built beside what was used to be the Kosi River. And uh, they say that the Musahas are being told not to eat fish, because fish causes scabies. Now, fish doesn't cause scabies. Whereas, the PVTGs in our area, in Santal Pargas, the Pahadias, Saudiya Pahadias, were told to not eat barbati beans, because that caused scabies. And people were doing business on this. The rich Mahajans in the area were doing business on the fish there, and using the Musahas to collect the fish, and doing business with the Barbati beans here. So they're othering them purposely, saying that you're getting sick because of a certain food you eat. So there's a system built in. We have to recognize the system. It's not easy because we have to open our spectacles. 
we've got those colored spectacles on. We don't recognize. I was just thinking, suddenly I remembered, I think last night on the train, passing Vizag or something, and I, I remember somebody in my class saying, you know, the Andhra is a very rough community. I said, good God, we said things like that and accepted things like that 40 years ago. How can you say such a thing? It, it wouldn't be accepted today. Why would you remember the, remind the person who said it? Say, so I didn't say that, but I remember they said it. It doesn't matter who said it. The point is we were brought up like that to other certain communities. We have to recognize that. Only then we can redress it. In what way are we othering people? Another question? It's the answer I can short, give in a short way form is the people who are doing this harm are privileged. And all of the issues are called privileged reactions. So I'm privileged. I didn't do this. My grandfather did it. I'm not. Doing it. Why should I be punished? That's the answer. That is one of my one of the issues. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that. Just to comment, these phenomena are global and very often cultural, and uh, it's a very, very, very hard thing to go by. Uh, but there has been progress over the years, but there are miles to go. Thanks. Uh, hi, Prabhi, and thank you. I'll just have a look at your questions. You said, does India have a public health crisis like racism? Yes, it does. The world has a public health crisis called racism. I'd prefer to call it oppressive discrimination because that's what it is. It is discrimination on the basis of any difference, the othering that goes on. It goes on in the States, the United States. You've got Native Americans, you go to African Americans. In Australia, as you know, I work in Aboriginal health. It goes on all the time. Uh, there is no country in the world that, is, that has been spared uh, this phenomenon. Uh, which communities are discriminated? I think people here would know that better. Are there still oppressive social privileges? I think that goes without. You, you, the answer is obviously yes. These are rhetorical questions. I think it's also important to recognize that when we say it's very hard, of course it's hard, but just because something is hard doesn't mean we don't tackle it. Just because something's going to take time doesn't mean we don't tackle it. And I think it has to start from us and within us. Every one of us has some level of prejudice. Prejudice in itself may or may not be a problem. It's whether we choose to act on it or not. If we choose to act on the basis of that prejudice, that then leads to problems, which goes on to things like racism. So it does start with us. When we talk about is it in CMC or is it in the system, we are part of the system. So how can we fail to recognize that we, each one of us has that privilege and each one of us carries that prejudice? And unless we indulge in some level of introspection, admit to a level of guilt, but I'm not talking about you know, uh, beating ourselves up and feeling guilty about it, but to be truly honest and reflective and say we have contributed and therefore everyone has a role to play in uh, creating some change on the other. It shouldn't be just left to heroes uh, you know, to do the work. I think it is uh, every institution and every organization has responsibility. In regards to whether it needs to be taught at CMC, um, you talked, I think, um, uh, was it you, Benjamin, who talked about the fact that ethics is now, or, or, or ethics is taught here at CMC. Well, how can racism not be a part of teaching about ethics? So the answers are all yes, yes, yes. Just a small comment. First of all, I think this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to point out, you know, all the comments that have been made, a lot of all these things are ingrained in us partly because of our own insensitivity. The shocking thing is, it is not just in rural India or tribal India, it's in urban India, right in the center of top institutions like even the All India Institute, where I have heard, I mean, this is hearsay, I have not been able to verify it, but I have been told that there are separate eating areas for medical students who belong to either a Dalit or a non-Dalit community by their birth. It is the most shocking thing that something like this exists in a hostel in one of the top medical colleges of our country. 
So if it exists there, I'm sure to some degree it may exist in all of us consciously or unconsciously. And I would strongly endorse, you know, it was very nice to read that educational programs that have started. So I think one of the things that have to be taught is, yes, the othering that we have in ourselves. Are you looking on a patient as belonging to this caste, belonging to this tribe, belonging to this community? Have you unconsciously, not deliberately, but unconsciously said this person is a stupid idiot because they don't know, because they can't read, because you know, you're a woman in the middle of the night with a baby at the guard. And I mean, it's ridiculous that situations like that should happen. And maybe if there is one mission hospital or one person or one class, somebody who receives this as something that they want to make a difference about, it will create impact and initiate change. Thank you, ma'am. In the interest of time, we will wind up the question. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Prabhi Kumar. It was a very interesting presentation. <laughs> we would like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. Our last speaker for today is from the batch of 7980, uh, Dr. Ira Goldsmith. He was back then the editor of The Toad, and now he's the honorary professor of cardiothoracic surgery in the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Sciences, Swansea University. And he's also the consultant surgeon in the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery, Morriston Hospital, Swansea, Wales in the UK. After graduation, he completed his service obligation with the leprosy mission in Bhutan, where he met his future wife, uh, June, and thereon he moved to England, where he trained as a cardiothoracic surgeon. He's had numerous publications from his MD research project in cardiac surgery, looking at thrombogenesis in patients with heart valve disease and prosthetic heart valves, and importantly, at the quality of life of patients following valve repair and replacement. His current project is 3D printing and surgical reconstruction of the chest wall. Ladies and gentlemen, Ira Goldsmith. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the privilege. I'm absolutely delighted to talk about my current project, 3D printing in surgery. 40 years ago, 3D printing to us was something out of science fiction, especially to me as an editor of The Toad. Today, 3D printing in surgery is a scientific fact. And let us explore and see how. My disclosures, especially this one, almost 40 years ago, standing here in Skada Auditorium, giving my talk with no electricity and hence no microphone. Benji and Alfie just checking. <laughs> it's working today. <laughs> it was in the light of the storm lantern there. You know. uh, and of course, today with my apologies for this extremely gruesome picture, especially for those of us who have got a weak stomach. But I'm a surgeon, and it looks like I've dug myself a great big hole in the left chest wall of this poor unfortunate man. He's lying in his right lateral position. I have just resected three of his ribs, which has left me uh, staring at his heart, the left lung, and the diaphragm. The question is, how do I fix it? But first, how did I end up with such a great big hole? A defect such as this usually results following a wide surgical resection of your primary chest wall tumor, for example, sarcoma, metastatic tumor, chest wall damaged by infection or radiotherapy, trauma, or congenital defects. In my experience, it's patients with primary chest wall sarcoma that are commonly deal with. For example, this young man with a left chest wall tumor, an incisional biopsy confirms grade one chondrosarcoma. Now, chondrosarcomas are not very chemo or radiosensitive. And the best treatment option for a good long-term survival is surgical resection. And as suggested by the Scandinavian study, with all around wide clear margins, followed by a robust reconstruction. 
Hence, we aim for a minimum of two centimeter margins in the soft tissue, muscle, or fat planes, four to five centimeter margins along the ribs, and take one normal rib above and below. Such a resection leaves us with a large defect, which then requires a pleural, skeletal, and soft tissue reconstruction. For the pleural and skeletal reconstruction, I've used the traditional methyl methylcholate cement sandwich processes, which I prepare at the time of surgery. I take a mesh, fold it in half, size the defect, stitch a pocket the size of the defect, prepare the orthopedic cement, inject that into the pocket, and then with a the roller, flatten it to the required thickness, and as the cement sets, mold it into shape. I secure the processes in place with interrupted ethyvon sutures, cover it with a previously harvested lateral mastocyte pedicle flap, and then close the wound. Preparing the processes is time consuming, takes me about an hour or so, but it does the job and cheaply. I was, however, obliged to look at 3D printing when a 70-year-old grandfather was referred to me with her rapidly enlarging right anterior chest wall chondrosarcoma. He walked into my clinic with a walking stick, had tremors of both his hands, was a diabetic, gave a history of schizophrenia, TIAs, angina, MI, and on his coronary angiogram had non-stentable but stable coronary artery disease. The tumor itself was arising from the third rib anteriorly and was sitting on the second, third, and fourth ribs. For all round clear margins, he required resection of his right hemisternum, the three ribs, taking the resection margin right down to the right mid axillary line, a large resection requiring a robust reconstruction. Due to his comorbidities, his coronary artery disease, and of course, for the sake of my own coronaries too, I wanted him to have as short a surgical time as possible. And that is when I looked at 3D printing for a pre-prepared prosthesis prepared prior to surgery and save at least an hour of surgical time. So what is 3D printing? How does it work? It's applications in surgery and a quick look at bioprinting in the future. 3D printing, like ordinary printing, is also driven by a computer-created design, but with a difference. The 3D printer deposits ink, but onto a platform, and uses layer by layer of precise deposition and positioning of metal, plastic, living cells, or material of your choice, with spatial control for their placement to manufacture the 3D structure. It fuses each layer with either heat, lasers, electron beams, chemicals, to manufacture the 3D structure. In the manufacturing world, we call it additive manufacturing or rapid prototyping. Of course, we like to call it 3D printing. And one can 3D print whatever design one creates on one's computer. To create the computer-aided design, the required precise digital information of patients, called the DICOM data, is obtained from their MRI scans, their high-resolution CT scans. The images are collected on the picture archiving and communication system, and then transferred to our computers for viewing in two dimension. Then with another software, for example, Mimix Medical, and a process called segmentation, the 2D image segments are stacked along the third axis, the Z axis, in the third dimension to create the 3D uh, design. Another software, for example, Geomagic Free From Plus, one can edit and repair the design as required, and when satisfied, create the final STL file. The STL file is then sent to our printers for 3D printing or rapid prototyping. And these are some of the examples of using cardiac MRI scans to fabricate complex congenital heart problems in babies to understand the pathology, the orientation to structures, and plan out the surgical resection. At our center, the maxillofacial surgeons use 3D printing to prepare customized cutting guides to plan the surgical resection and the reconstruction. For example, with this man with a left mandibular tumor, with segmentation and editing, a virtual 3D model of the tumor and mandible was created, and planes where to defy the mandible was precisely worked out. The customized cutting guides were prepared and edited for drill holes and securing holes. And the same was done for the left fibular graft to be used for filling the defect. A 3D printed cradle to hold and support the implant was similarly fabricated and a successful reconstruction carried out with an excellent result. And this brings me back to the patient I mentioned earlier. Can I use this emerging technology in my patient to reconstruct his chest wall with a pre-prepared, customized, anatomical, 3D-printed titanium implant. So using his CT images and with segmentation, we recreated the tumor and chest wall in 3D. For all around clear margins, I grew the tumor by two centimeters and worked out the resection margins on the sternum medially 
and the ribs laterally, and then use the anatomical shape and features of the sternum and ribs to create the customized anatomical implant. To secure the implant to the sternum and ribs, we incorporated fixating holes and designed rabbit edges or stepped edges for the implant to sit on the bone and slot into the defect perfectly. We added perforations to the main body to keep the implant light and encourage tissue ingrowths. Uh, a prototype of the implant was then tested in our laboratory and the implant was then 3D printed in titanium using laser technology. At surgery, to my great satisfaction, the implant fitted the defect perfectly and I secured it in place with interrupted ethibon sutures. At follow-up, and now four years down the line, there is no pain, dislocation, or paradoxical movement. Unlike the cement sandwich processes, which is prone to infection, dislocation, and paradoxical movement. Since then, I have reconstructed larger defects using this technology with excellent results. No deaths, no infections, pain, dislocation, or paradoxical movement. Over the years, we have witnessed the progress of science as humankind has worked out new ways of doing things from the Stone Age, the Industrial Revolution, and the Digital Revolution. 40 years ago, watching science fiction movies and seeing food items materialize on voice command was pure science fiction. Today, this is a 3D printed burger manufactured using 3D printing technology. 3D bioprinting has taken 3D printing to a completely new level. 3D bioprinting also works like 3D printing but uses biological materials, biochemicals, and living cells to fabricate 3D biostructures. The most common methods used are inkjet bioprinting, the most common one, micro extrusion bioprinting, and laser assisted bioprinting. This is a 3D bioprinting of a bronchus and 3D printed bronchi in petri dishes responding to histamine with contraction and to ventolin with relaxation, what has been described as an asthma attack in a dish. And in May 2019, the journal Science described a functional 3D bioprinted mini tissue building block of the lung, the air sac, capable of exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. One day in the future, perhaps many years from now, bioprinting many millions of this mini tissue building block using the patient's own cells and assembling them into a larger tissue or organ structure, we may have an organ, the lung, for human transplantation. Now, this may sound like science fiction, but it is for us to make sure that that's a scientific fact. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues and my institution for their support for my project, and thank you all for your very kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ira. That is perfect timing. Uh, any questions? Waving. You know, fascinating work. Uh, Thank you. Congratulations. Now, uh, you were talking about uh, 3D printing of bronchi. So as a physician, I'm a little more interested in bronchi than the chest wall. Uh, so do you know how, far, how close it is to, uh, to be clinically used? How close are we? Uh, well, at the moment, uh, uh, let's put it like this. Uh, you know, bioprinting and, you know, is all about tissue replacement and organ transplantation, right? And there's a lot of research, and I mentioned that in the, you know, the, one of the references. We are very close to that. You know, like, we can actually bioprint bronchi, and they do respond to, you know, like, uh, laboratory tests, like. And so in medicine, especially because you're a chest physician, you know, it's a great way of actually testing out drugs, et cetera, et cetera, using the patients. We don't need to use animal models. We are using actually human sort of so-called models to test out drugs and all. So there's a lot of advances on that. Coming to your question about whether we are in the position to, yes, you know, in, in Cambridge, you know, my colleagues, you know, like we are trying to look into that and see how we can take that forward. That's part of the project. Right. So we use That's silicon. where I'll stop. Yeah, yeah, we use silicon at the moment. Yes. But what you're proposing would be, you know, miles ahead of what silicon would do for patients. Yes. In our own, in our own uh, institution in Swansea, we are actually preparing what you call bioprinted uh, so-called scaffolds. Because, you see, for bioprinting organs, you need the scaffold. You need the, what you call the cells to then populate the scaffold. And you need to make sure that this, they remain viable, have neural connection, vascular supply, etc. 
and we are we have sort of we are trying to work on the bone at the moment, but we have successfully done so in cartilages at the moment, not the bone. Thank you. Thank you. So one more question for you. So what is the role of 3D printing in, especially in solid organ transplants like heart, liver, and kidney? And also what are the operational costs and logistics involved in 3D printing and its use in medical therapeutics? Sure. I think the uh, first question I'll leave for the last, but coming to the cost. I mean, what I actually described was the advantages of 3D printing. You know, I didn't really harp on too much on the dis oh, you know, disadvantages. Uh, one of the disadvantages is cost. You know, it is very expensive. You know, like the 3D printed burger costed $300,000. You know, <laughs> uh, the implant which I made cost me about, say, 4,000 pounds. Now, you know, in cardiac surgery, we replace implants, uh, valves, you know, like which cost about 3,000 pounds anyways. You know, so, you know, is it really that much? Well, that's an argument which people have. Uh, but what people actually uh, have also said is that, see, what about your time? I mean, as a surgeon, I spent hours in the laboratory working out the, you know, like the software, working on the software, working on the models, etc. Whereas in the theater, if I'd used the traditional method, I would have just spent one hour, you know. So they say, well, you're spending a lot of money and time preparing the prosthesis, but actually that's about the surgeon, isn't it, and the team. It is, it is very much about the patient, really. I mean, like that patient, I'm sure Honest Paul is here, and as an anesthetist, you know, you really don't want too, much, too long a surgical time on a patient with that, those sort of comorbidities. And the shorter the anesthetic time, surgical time, the less fewer the complications. So you save a lot of, you know, it's for the patient. You, you really do it for the patient. So, you know, the human cost versus the monetary cost has to be balanced. So that is why it is important to tailor make it tailor make it to the patient, you know, select your patients very carefully, and that way you can address the costs. Coming back to your first question, yes, I mean, like, uh, I did give uh, the author's uh, reference in my, you know, uh, presentation, Atala. They have done a lot of work in kidney transplant, uh, you know, in kidney uh, work and bladder, and in the bladder, yes, you know, you can actually replace the bladder, and they are functional, and it's amazing, you know, like, what all can be done about that. Uh, Kidneys again, they are working on that. It's not still there. You know, it, the kidney is a bigger, you know, like issue because you need to make sure that it has got the vascular and the neural connections, viability issues and all. So there's a lot of research going on into that. Other organ transplants, I mean, lung and all, I think they're still a, you know, a few distance away, but we're working towards that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for liver, that's right. I think, yeah, oh yeah, actually I didn't show you the slide, but you know, you know, it's a 40-minute talk, you know, like, which I condensed to 10 minutes, and I did actually put the liver on my slide, but yes, you're right, Sanjay. I, I just want to mention the situation in India. Um, firstly, uh, we, in fact, have a 3D association, a printing association in India. They hold a exclusive medical conference every year. And what they do is in that conference is they show all the uh, sort of, you know, devices and all the sort of implants and all that are being manufactured. Now, in India, what is being done is firstly, an example of an institution having it is Amrita. They were one of the pioneers here, the cardiothoracic department. Amrita has their own 3D printing lab. But actually, what also happens is in Bangalore and big cities, these 3D printers, uh, some of them are specialized, these companies have specialized in medical 3D printing. And what you have to do is you have to send all your images and all your 3D images and so on to them. And therefore what they do is on a, you know, on a case by case basis, they will actually do the 3D printing for you on almost anything, whether it's an implant, whether it's you know, even bio uh, uh, printing and so on. So, and their cost is much more affordable because they distributed among other customers who are there. So basically, it's like a service, like say, like, a, like going to a Xerox center, where you basically, you know, you hand over your, uh, this thing, and, and uh, so there are companies, Osteo3D, like this, there are companies in Bangalore, and the big cities. And the 3D uh, Association of India is very much interested into pushing that medical, uh, you know, uh, they have their specialist centers, so that's how you are able to, I think, uh, Sanjay, you must be knowing this, right, Dr. Uh, Goel? 
in Bangalore, we have many of these uh, the, 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 uh, 3D printing. I don't know if you're using any of them yourself. Okay, but now the cost has come down a lot. You know, if you, if you go, and I think you want to see the... Uh, they've also gone to implants and all that now, yeah. Okay, you're doing so. 3D imaging is what you're talking about. The scaffolding and, I mean, printing the scaffolding and then depositing cells is not coming to clinical practice. It's still experimental. Some guys, I think, have done no, it. No, not, no, not, in, not into humans. Not in humans. Is it? Yeah, because I, I, there were presentations in that yeah. conference yeah. from not certain in humans. centers. The, the cells function, but they've not oh. done it, in, put it into anything. And what about Amrita and all that? They have not done they've it They've not also? done it. Okay. But they, so it's mainly used for anatomy. Right. So, and practicing surgeries and all that stuff. Yeah, but for then, that, it be, turns out to be, you know, in then those the orthopedicians, I say, I heard that for plates different. and all Orthopedics that. Orthopedics guys right. use it for, right. uh, and the again, implants. for tumors, just like IRAs used it. Right. Uh, for, for okay, so maybe, you know, <laughs> some advancements have been made, but what I would like to say is that that's how the costing has been sort of, you know, handled out here. Because they take uh, these centers, uh, take in the orders, and they customize it for you, and that's how they manage to. You don't have to have a complete 3D printing lab as a hospital. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. I agree with you, you know, like because uh, you know, although we did all the work in the hospital, we do it in our labs. Uh, the 3D titanium implant, we actually outsource it to a company called uh, Renishaw in Miskin, which is just cl very close by. And uh, so the actual model is printed there. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ira, for that excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the uh, CME. Thanks very much for all the uh, speakers for keeping the audience quite engaged and uh, interactive. Uh, I would like to present a small memento to our Vice Principal Research, Dr. Sushina, on behalf of the Alumni Association. <laughs>